as soon as possible. Okay. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to speak to and to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. Let me move the motion. My name at the outset. Uh, almost a year ago, President Officer, this Parliament was able to affirm by backing motion my name, its support for the Independent Fair Work Convention's ambition <laughs> to make Scotland a fair work nation by 2025. Today provides us an opportunity to reassert our support for that ambition. In that debate, uh, a year ago, I committed to leading the publication of a Fair Work Action Plan, setting out how this government and our partners will take forward a range of measures to embed the principles of fair work in our society. President officer, I'm pleased to be able to confirm to Parliament that our action plan was published on the 27th of February. In pulling together our fair work action plan, we have sought to work with others, the Fair Work Convention, the STUC, business in the community of Scotland, and individual businesses and organisations. I want to thank them for their support and assistance. The evidence is clear that fair work is good for workers, good for business, and good for Scotland. For workers, fair work brings increased security, better physical health, and greater psychological well-being. For business, it provides a platform to ensure a more engaged and committed workforce. Workers who spot challenges and opportunities, solve problems, offer insight and ideas for business improvement, and create value. Fair work can also drive productivity gains, release untapped potential, and inspire innovation. It adds value to jobs and business, and creates a stronger, more sustainable and inclusive economy. If today's debate offers us the opportunity to reflect on the progress we've made in our journey, but also the distance we must yet travel. We established the Fair Work Convention in 2015 to offer us independent advice. We've endorsed the vision set out in their framework for fair work to be embedded in workplaces across Scotland by 2025, built in the five dimensions that they have identified as to what that constitutes. Work that offers effective voice, work that offers opportunity, work that offers security, work that offers fulfilment, and work that offers respect. Willie Rennie. I agree with all the Minister's ambitions on this, but can he tell us why progress to get businesses to sign up to the business pledge has been so slow? I mean, it's a pathetically small number that have signed up. Why is that? Minister. Well, I'm going to come to the business pledge. I recognise that not enough people, uh, not enough businesses have signed up to it. That's why we committed to refreshing the business pledge, and I'll come to that uh, a little later because that was part of the work of this uh, action plan. It was an office of fair work is uh, that which balances the rights and responsibilities of employers and workers and work that generates benefits for individuals, organisations, and society. Decent pay is, of course, fundamental to fair work. We were the first government in the UK to become an accredited living wage employer. Our support in promoting the real living wage, funding the Poverty Alliance to take forward a range of activity, has seen over 25,000 people in Scotland have an increase in pay to at least the living wage through the Living Wage Accreditation Scheme. It seems to achieve our ambition of 1,000 Scots-based accredited living wage employers with currently over 1,300 in Scotland. And it sees us as the best performing of all four UK countries in terms of a proportion of the workforce paid at least the real living wage. Still, we must do more. There remains too many in our working population paid less than that level. We will continue to work with and fund the Poverty Alliance to further increase the number of people employed who are paid the real, at least the real living wage by at least a further 25,000 over the period to 2021. We'll target low paid sectors and we'll work to create more living wage places following Dundee's lead as our first living, living wage city announced just last week. We also provided funding to enable adult social care workers to be paid the real living wage. The Fair Work Convention continued to provide Scottish ministers with expert advice and recommendations, most recently through their report on fair work in the social care sector in Scotland. The government welcomes the Convention's activity and their report. Our action plan sets out that we will work with partners to consider and respond to the recommendations it lays out to ensure that fair work is embedded in the delivery of social care services, including the procurement process. The President Office, we are making progress in other areas. We collaborated with the Scottish Trade Union Congress to publish the Severe Weather Charter. We have developed statutory guidance and best practice on fair work in public procurement. We have developed a fair work agreement between Scottish ministers and civil service trade unions. The 22 projects received support through our Workplace Equality Fund, which delivers employer-led innovative solutions to overcome workforce inequality. We will expand that fund 
this coming year to enable businesses with innovative ideas to embed the dimensions of the Fair Work framework in their workplaces. And we'll continue to call on the UK Government to respond to the challenge of creating a Fair Work environment. From introducing the, the Trade Union Act to blocking the private members bill that Stuart MacDonald MP brought forward seeking to ban unpaid work trials, the UK Government has demonstrated we cannot rely on them on the Fair Work agenda. As we lay out in our action plan, we will continue to make the strong case that they need to go further, to put fair work at the centre of labour market policy. Presiding officer, just as I recognise we've made progress but face challenge, so too do I recognise that we must work with others to listen and learn. Along with the Fair Work Convention, I will host an international Fair Work Summit later this year. I want this to be an opportunity, yes, to spotlight what Scotland is achieving, but also to learn from elsewhere and share best practice. And in the coming weeks, I will invite all parties in this parliament to participate in a Fair Work Roundtable so we can collectively identify actions to ensure Fair Work is embedded in Scotland's workplaces by 2025. Our Fair Work Action Plan will not sit fixed in time. It will evolve to respond to changes to our economy and our society. I want to hear from others in that process of development and I commit to Parliament to pursue the Fair Work agenda in an inclusive way. If there's an officer, many employers already demonstrate Fair Work. They must build on this and convey the compelling case for Fair Work to get every employer in Scotland fully behind our effort. And to help employers, the Scottish Government will introduce a new benchmarking tool which will identify practical steps to help progress their fair work journey. We'll work with small and micro employers to develop a new online service to access guidance, support and tools to help adopt fairer practices. And as part of our activity in drawing together our action plan, we've engaged extensively with employers over the past year, including to review the Scottish Business Pledge. We have responded to business feedback and more clearly and more clearly aligned the pledge to our Fair Work agenda. It retains payment of the real living wage as a core commitment and includes environmental impact for the first time. As I have set out to Willie Rennie, I want to see more businesses taking our pledge. That's why we are creating a new business-led learning network to better support businesses to achieve the business pledge. And through our action plan, the President Officer, we have set out our determination that all public investment promotes fair work. Through our new Fair Work First approach announced by the First Minister in October last year, we will make full use of the Scottish Government's financial powers. By the end of this Parliament, we will attach Fair Work criteria to as many funding streams, business support grants and public contracts as we can. This will then drive investment in skills and training, no inappropriate use of zero's contracts, action to tackle the gender pay gap, genuine workforce engagement, including with trade unions, and payment of the real living wage. Of course. Neil Findlay. Uh, I welcome what the Minister said, but can I advise uh, um, why it was the government rejected such proposals when they were put forward by Labour during the passage of the previous public uh, procurement bill? Jamie Hepburn. Well, I find that an extraordinary intervention right now from a party, President Officer, whose leader just this weekend stood up and said he now supports the devolution of employment law to this place, something this party has long called for, long campaigned for, and he now stands there and makes virtue of the fact his party is calling for it when they stood square against it when we had the Smith Commission process. So we all have records we can stand behind, uh, Mr Finlay. I think the point that we should make, and the point I will hope to work forward from on a collective, inclusive basis, is how we move forward. In that regard, I welcome the Labour Party's movement on uh, the devolution of employment law. What we will do is we will work with the Scottish Enterprise to pilot Fair Work First, starting with regional selective assistant grants awarded from next month. President officer, these are some of the actions we will take to continue to promote our fair work agenda. We will work with business organisations, with individual employers and workers 
with the Fair Work Convention and our trade union partners and with all parties in this parliament to keep Scotland at the forefront of progressive policy, policy thinking and action. We will continue to listen, respond and support organisations at various stages of their Fair Work journey. We will work to build a Fair Work movement and to put Fair Work, fair work at the heart of the Scottish approach to growing the economy. That is the aim of our Fair Work Action Plan, which I commend to this Parliament and beyond. I now call on Jamie Halcrow Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 16257.3. Mr. Uh, Halcrow Johnson, six. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. People should be treated fairly in the workplace. In taking up a job, our laws recognise that employees have certain rights, rights that are inalienable, rights that cannot be waived or simply signed away in an agreement brought about by unfair or unequal bargaining positions. We've long recognised the need to enforce employment rights. And they've often reflected some of the most fundamental rights that individuals have in our society. In the past, these battles were often fought on indented servitude, the conditions in the factories, equal pay, and disability discrimination. For some, the question was about the most basic right of all, to come home safely from work at the end of the day. And across many of these areas, there are still examples to be found of bad practice, still progress to be made. As the labour market and working practices have changed, there are new challenges for building fairness in the workplace. We must translate the principles beyond our employment rights into circumstances quite different from when these principles were first envisaged. Members will be aware that the UK government has been looking into this area and published the similarly named Good Work Plan at the end of last year. I'm hopeful that ministers in this parliament will have been having discussions with the UK government on the potential for cooperation, because as the Scottish government's action plan acknowledges, collaboration, engagement and influence will be key to furthering its objectives. It's important, too, that solid links are built with business and that the Scottish Government uses its influence to persuade employees, employers of the benefits that fair working conditions provide. As we have recently marked International Women's Day, it is worth reflecting on some of the issues that persist around gender in the workplace. Across the UK, we are seeing gender pay gap that is at its lowest level in decades. But despite these achievements, the present position is simply and straightforwardly not good enough. It is important that governments at all, levels at all levels continue to encourage employers to look at pay differentials and take action against their gender-based disadvantage. In too many occupations, however, we're still seeing occupational segregation, including in areas like high-paying high STEM jobs. Unfortunately, this gender segregation in employment begins at an early age. When it comes to subject choice, we see stark contrasts that continue through education. In colleges, in apprenticeships, and in universities, even in new schemes like foundation apprenticeships, the old gendered subject choices have been allowed to filter through. Another area that we, ha that we do have to tackle is the barriers to returning to work following a pregnancy. As the action plan recognizes, the Scottish Government has introduced its Women Returners Programme. In regard to this programme, as with others, others, evidence and data gathering are vital. We should be able to say clearly what impact government interventions are having on the labour market, and as clearly as possible, what those interventions, uh, where those interventions are working. In publishing the Fair Work Action Plan, the Scottish Government acknowledged that it will form part of a suite of labour act market action plans that include disability, employment, delivery plan, the gender pay uh, gap action plan, and the future skills action plan. I've spoken a little about the, uh, the gender pay gap, but it's worth considering these other areas too. As our economy changes more rapidly, a proper focus on reskilling and lifelong learning will be essential. In terms of employment for people with disabilities, there has been good progress in this area across the UK for some years now. But our ambition should be nothing short of tr transformative. For far too long, far too many people with disabilities have found themselves excluded from the labour market and from, and from fulfilling their ambitions. While there is certainly a large body of strategic direction, a large body of strategic direction, we must be sure that we can judge its effectiveness. The action plan suggests that a set of indicators will be crafted and that annual reports on progress will be provided beginning in March 2020. This is all positive, but these indicators must be carefully crafted, thorough and useful in determining the success or failure of individual interventions. Yes. Neil Finlay. I hear him uh, uh, talking about the rights of disabled people. I wonder if we would reflect on his government's treatment of disabled people particularly through the benefit system and the horrific impact on people claiming universal credit and other benefits. Jamie Halcrow-Johnson. 
thank the uh, member for that intervention. Um, as the member will be aware, there are now more disabled people working uh, than there have been before. And as we have these conversations, as we have these conversations, every time the, la the same questions come from the Labour benches, every time the same answers are given. One area that we can certainly monitor effectively has been the considerable increase in employment levels, both here and in Scotland, uh, both here in Scotland and across the UK, to unprecedented historic highs. Fair work must, by necessity, start with work. Access to employment should underpin the Scottish Government's commitment to building a fair work nation if it, is into, if it is to be successful. With that in mind, skills and employability are key, as are specific schemes like Fair Start Scotland. Again, the need to monitor their effectiveness and impact is no less important. Another welcome feature of our labour market has been the increase in levels of pay in the last year, firmly ahead of inflation. After disappointing growth following the 2008 financial crash, there are now good signs that we are re-entering positive real terms growth on a consistent basis. At the lower end of the pay spectrum, the national living wage has been significant. The IFS recognised in its report last year that hourly wage growth has been 10% has been 10 for the lowest paid workers in comparison to low, uh, lower growth at the median. At its core, however, the basis of sustainable growth in earnings must be an increase in productivity. The action plan notes its view that fair work can have a role to play in this. The conclusions of the Fraser of Allender Institute in 2016 on fair work and productivity, uh, productivity cover much of this territory. But equally, these measures must be coupled with actions to encourage business growth, entrepreneurship, and innovation. How the fair work agenda translates to small and medium-sized enterprises will be important. Draw to a close, please. It is often in this sector that we have seen the slowest uh, response to change, given the increased pressures. Presiding officer, encouraging fair growth is, I'm sure, uh, will be welcomed uh, across the fairness at work. Sorry, will be welcomed across the changer. But it must keep pace with the developments of the labour market and the workplace. There is a need to ensure that interventions that are made by the Scottish Government in the labour market are both effective and can be seen as effective. I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Richard Leonard to speak to and move amendment 16257.1 for up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you. And can, can I remind members of my uh, register of interests? Uh, let me begin by commending the Scottish Government. Uh, their recent agreement with the three civil service unions uh, is welcome. It recognises the role of collective bargaining, offers a commitment to the living wage and to the principles of flexible working and to a diverse workforce. It commits the government to check off and the protection of trade union facility time. So this is a fair work agreement uh, that is welcome. But the overall fair work action plan, which we are debating this afternoon, is by comparison timid, lacking ambition and a sense of urgency. And of course, I'm sure that those working women and men on building sites across Scotland, all those industrious people working long hours in factories and offices, the length and breadth of the country and the workers, the young workers especially, contracted on zero hours in shops and bars on every high street in the land, I'm sure they will have rejoiced when they heard the news in the minister's press release that as a result of his action plan, a new benchmarking tool is now available and that a refreshed business pledge is to be adopted and that a more tailored approach is the new norm. I bet those workers can't wait. I bet they can't wait for the real living wage to be rolled out to another 25,000 people over the next three years, still leaving 450,000 people working on poverty pay in Scotland. It was also claimed uh, in the minister's press release uh, and these were the words attributed to him, so I assume that these are the words that he spoke, that many employers are already championing the dimensions of fair work. So how many have signed up to the Scottish Government's business pledge? Well, when I checked last night, it was 601. There are over 108,000 private sector employees in Scotland. In other words, only 0.5% of Scotland's employers have signed up to the Scottish Government's business pledge. This is, this is not a mark of success. It is a 99% rate of failure. Yes. Michelle Ballantyne. You agree with me that just because a business hasn't signed up to this pledge doesn't mean it's enacting its contents. Richard Leonard. Yes, but this is a specific goal of the government to get businesses to sign up to them. And the fact that only uh, a half a percentage point of them have uh, is in my view a sign of failure. Uh, and worse than that, the Scottish Government makes clear in this action plan that it wants to stick with the current approach, that it wants to, in its own words, retain the light touch 
Uh, well, when it comes to employment standards, the working women and men of Scotland are not looking for a Scottish government with a light touch. They are looking for one with a firm and a principled touch, one which is prepared to use the leverage that it has. A government which is prepared to say that if you are not a living wage employer, if you operate exploitative zero hours contracts, if you deploy tax avoidance, like those umbrella companies so rife in the construction industry, that you will not win public procurement contracts and you will not receive governmental support. Now, of course, we recognise, we recognise that the action plan promises to make awards of regional selective assistance dependent on adherence to a set of fair work measures from the start of the next financial year. We welcome that, of course we welcome that. We've been calling for it for years. But the corollary of this is this. Why is the government prepared, therefore, to continue to offer other funds and other business support, support to employers across Scotland which pay below the living wage, which continue to operate zero-hours contracts and which do not fulfil their legal duties under the Equality Act? And why is it prepared to keep on paying these companies for up to two more years? Yes, I'll give way. Jamie Hepburn. As much as I'm thoroughly enjoying Richard Leonard's dissemination of all the woes and strife that exists in Scotland right now, there was an invitation to each and every party in this parliament to come together to discuss the basis of what we set in the action plan, to come together to further uh, the Fair Work agenda. I've not heard one idea yet. Will he have any by the time he accepts that invitation? Richard oh. Leonard. Well, well, well I, I hope my remarks are a contribution to the discussion about how we take this, how we take this forward. Because the truth is the landscape of public procurement under the SNP's watch is scarred with unfair work practices. Look at the care sector. Just a few weeks ago, Silver Line Care, with six care homes in Scotland, funded largely from the public purse, moved to de-recognise the GMB. Look at the building of the new Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary, where laying a rock refused to allow trade union organisation on the site, let alone any kind of collective agreement. And the same company is following the same practices on the Edinburgh St James development, which the First Minister, back then the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities, hailed as innovative, which would, in her words, stimulate growth in the short term and lay the foundations for long-term success. But that's not quite the picture Unite has painted for me. They say that on this contract, Ling O'Rourke do not support the policy of the Scottish Government's fair work vision of effective voice. They say they steadfastly refuse to allow the union to speak to members freely within the welfare facilities on the site. Equally, they do not recognise collective bargaining, bargaining arrangements or trade union organisation through stewards, reps, etc. And this is a publicly funded project with Scottish Government money in it. So let me end where I began. It is to the government's credit that it has struck a fair work agreement with the civil service trade unions. But if on a construction site, just a few yards from its St Andrews House headquarters, on a government-funded public project, there is a denial of basic employment rights, basic human rights, I would argue, then the Scottish Government is clearly failing in its duty to the people and in its obligation to use all the powers which it has open to it, which is why I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Alison Johnson to speak to and move amendment 16257.2 for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Fraser, the Fraser of Allender Institute define fair work as work that offers effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfilment and respect. And these benefits underpin one another. Employees who can make their voice heard are more likely to feel fulfilled by their work and respected in the workplace. The Research Institute is clear that fair work leads to better quality and more fulfilling jobs. And that's why I'm pleased to welcome the publication of the government's Fair Work Action Plan as the next step in the process of creating fair working conditions for all in Scotland. We certainly do have to keep moving forward in this area at a time when zero hours contracts are prevalent amongst the younger generation, though not exclusively found amongst our young people, and where some employers remain resistant to paying the real living wage. And it remains the case that a woman's earnings over her lifetime are likely to be markedly lower than her male colleagues. The UK has the ninth highest gender pay gap of OECD countries. 
The gap between the average earnings of women and the average earnings of men is a shocking 16.5%. And you can do better. You know, this is compared with a gap of just 5.7% in Denmark, 7.2% in New Zealand. So it's clear that while the government is making progress on the Fair Work agenda, I'm sure we'd all agree that there's still much more to be done because everyone deserves to be paid a wage that lifts them out of poverty and no one should be paid less because of their gender. And Greens have persistently called for government business support services, including grants and loans, to apply ethical criteria, such as the payment of the real living wage, no use of exploitative contracts, union recognition, and no tax avoidance or use of tax havens. Our 2016 manifesto pledged that Greens would campaign to make business support available only to those companies who plan to pay the real living wage, to avoid zero hours contracts, to recognise trade unions, to reduce the gap between the highest and lowest paid, to pay women and men equally, and to be environmentally responsible. Indeed, we were pleased that the government backed our amendment calling for such conditions to be set during a similar debate in May 2017. And I am pleased that this has now been incorporated into the Fair Work Action Plan. The Fair Work First programme will place a new set of criteria for businesses to meet when applying for government grants and business support. The plan states that employers will be asked to commit to investment in skills and training, to taking action to close the gender pay gap, to pay the real living wage, and to enhance workforce engagement to be eligible for that government business support. Now, in the past, the Scottish Government has been resistant to our calls to place additional ethical criteria on business grants and loans, preferring the approach of paving the high road by rewarding good behaviour of businesses rather than blocking the low road taken by the poorly behaving businesses. But this approach is limited. Yes, there will always be those businesses who genuinely want to do the right thing and might just need a bit of help to make it financially viable. For example, how to build those initial costs of a living wage policy into their financial planning. But there will always be those too who will find it beneficial to push exploitation as far as they can get away with and regulation and enforcement will be needed to steer them onto the high path. Um, I you know, like to think that, that when they're steered onto the, that high path, they too will be convinced of the benefits of such practice. But limiting our focus to only incentivising good behaviour on the part of employers won't help us create the conditions of fair work across our economy. Now, we recognise that the Scottish Government doesn't have control over all the policy levers as regulation of employment remains reserved. The attachment of fair work standards to government-funded grants, loans and businesses is a very important step, one we've been calling for over years um, the Green Amendment welcomes this progress, but it goes further. It asks once again that we take a wider look at our economy, moving beyond the ideological fixation of delivering economic growth. You know, we do have to look at non-growth, you know, well-being factors like health, like job security. And I will expand on these in my closing remarks. Um, as for the other amendments today... I welcome Labour's calls that we should look at how fair work conditions can be improved through procurement processes, but so long as we don't have full control over Scotland's economy, we can't progress this. And it would also be unreasonable not to recognise the positive steps which have been taken on strengthening the fair work agenda in this latest action plan. We agree with Labour on the need to go further and faster, but we want to see the commitment to achieving fair work standards by 2025 remain in the final motion. The Conservatives cite the, UK government's, uh, the UK's Good Work Action Plan in their amendment. There are some positive developments in it. It does represent a failure, though, to use the real powers of regulation and enforcement that the UK government has available, but this government doesn't. And it also comes from a government which has introduced its scam national living wage, which is significantly below the real living wage and which only applies to older workers. Thus increasing, I have 20 seconds, uh, thus increasing the exploitation of younger workers. So Greens will not be supporting this amendment. Um, I look forward to hearing from colleagues across the chamber as the debate progresses. Thank you. Unless I misheard, I don't think you moved your amendment, Ms Johnson. I move the amendment in my name, presiding officer. I now call Willie Rennie for up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I do find it difficult to concentrate on this debate this afternoon, 
it, whilst the UK Parliament is utterly paralysed, the Prime Minister's deal is clearly stone dead and uncertainty continues to damage our economy with no end in sight to that uncertainty. Um, the case for uh, the British people to have the final say on a Brexit deal can hardly be stronger. Uh, certainly. Neil Finlay. I understand his uh, thoughts are elsewhere. Wouldn't it be great, given what we're discussing today, if, if, if the, uh, the people of the UK did have a say and we had a general election with a Labour government coming in that would implement an agenda, <laughs> implement an agenda that would address many of the issues that we're addressing today? Willie Rennie. Uh, I, I, I commend Neil Finlay for his, uh, for his cheek in making that intervention. Um, but we do support the general aims of the fair work agenda for the Scottish Government. Who can be against greater security for workers, decent wages and a greater voice for those workers? Liberal Democrats believe that it is the workers that are a key to the success of any business. Treat them well and they will treat businesses well. Maximising the talents of our people and ensuring everyone participates in the economic success of our country is the route to that greater success. We support the real living wage and the pressure on companies to pay that real living wage has created a virtuous circle of decent wages amongst competitors for a limited pool of good workers. Members will be aware that I had been encouraging Amazon to pay the proper living wage for some time. I communicated with them through the media, but also in person um, visiting the fulfillment centre in Dunfermline on a number of occasions. I'm pleased to see now that Amazon have responded and are paying increased wage levels. And I've received reports of the knock-on effects too. Businesses in Fife who compete for good workers have now responded and are paying increased wage levels too. Otherwise, they would lose workers to Amazon. I'd also pressurised the Scottish Government on this too. I'd argued that Amazon and companies like Amazon should not receive government grants if they fail to pay the real living wage. I am pleased to see that the government has responded positive to, positively to that as well with the First Minister's comments eh, quite recently. Um, I did pick up from the Minister in his opening remarks about some of the detail about how that will be implemented, although I was disappointed to see that it was just a pilot. I am concerned that it might be a limited pool of companies that that might affect. And I would like to know in the summing up from the Minister, or maybe take an intervention now, exactly what the extent of this pilot will be. Jamie Hepburn. Just, just for the absolute purpose of clarity, this is not a pilot. This is the beginning of the rolling out of the Fair Work First principles. We've said we'll start with regional selective assistance and then we work forwards from there. So it is not a pilot. Willie Rennie. I, I stand corrected. If I thought the Minister had said pilot in his introductory remarks, but he still didn't say exactly how many businesses in the first instance this will cover, because the fear is that this will take some time to be implemented, and I am concerned that the Minister does not move fast enough, because we did plague the government for some time to move on this, and they resisted doing so. So he will not be... He must forgive me for being a little bit sceptical about how fast he's going to move eh, on this. Um, the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee found employment significantly reduces the chances of reoffending, but that only 50% of employees would consider, employers would consider employing someone who has come out of prison. I would encourage the Minister to perhaps include something for ex-prisoners in the business pledge in future to make sure that we are maximising the potential of ex-prisoners to our economy. Uh, the business pledge is commendable, but I do question the impact that it is having on business practice in Scotland. With only 500 businesses signed up, the impact is pretty limited. The Minister has failed to persuade more than 99% of Scottish businesses to sign up. And of the 25 largest businesses in Scotland, most have not been convinced of its worth. Here are some who the government have not got on board. Scottish Widows, RBS, Bank of Scotland, Scottish Power, Aegon, William Grant & Sons, Chivas Group, The Weir Group, Agreco, Life Technologies, Arnold Clark, Chevron North Sea, Stagecoach, Tesco Bank. I mean, the list goes on and on of major businesses in Scotland who have not been convinced 
by Jamie Hepburn and his business pledge. And I want to know why that is. Why has the minister been incapable of getting the top 25 businesses alone to sign up to this business pledge? Business Insider are clear who the top 25 businesses are. I want to know whether the business minister has been to see these businesses, whether he's encouraged them to sign up, and what are the reasons why they've not signed up to, to this pledge. The business pledge has been around for some years now, so the government have got very few excuses. Having a conference and getting cross-party talks is no cover for the government's in incapability of finding a solution to this. The business pledge needs to be much more successful if we are to make sure that businesses across Scotland are engaging in the Fair Work Action Plan, are engaging in the principles or the, the actual worthy principles that the Minister set out at the beginning. But there is no point in having a Fair Work Action Plan if nobody's going to take part in the action plan, if nobody's actually going to step up and say, we're going to improve the conditions of our workers in these companies. 25 companies, the biggest companies in Scotland, they've not signed up to the pledge. Why is that? The minister needs to explain it in his summing up. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of absolutely no more than six minutes. We have very, very little time in hand. And I call Annabelle Ewing to be followed by Bill Bowman. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have been called to speak in this debate today on the important subject of fair work, and more specifically on the Scottish Government's recently published Fair Work Action Plan. As we have heard, the plan sets forth a number of key action points to be implemented to ensure that the goal of Scotland being a fair work nation by 2025 is indeed achieved. Quite rightly, the plan envisages close collaboration with employers, employees and trades unions, all of whose input and collaboration will be vital in ensuring that Scotland becomes a fair work nation. The genesis of this ambition can be seen in the establishment by the Scottish Government of the Fair Work Convention back in April 2015. The Fair Work Convention is independent of government and acts as an advisory body to government. It is co-chaired by Professor Patricia Finlay and by Graeme Smith, General Secretary of the STUC. The Convention already has done, in my view, a power of work in pushing this agenda forward. And indeed, it published its Fair Work Framework in 2016. In that framework document, it set forth its vision that by 2025, people in Scotland would have a world-leading working life where fair work indeed drives forward success, uh, ensures well-being and prosperity for individual uh, workers, uh, uh, benefits employers and organisations, and indeed uh, is a benefit for society as a whole. I'll take an intervention. James Kelly. Annabelle Ewan for taking the intervention. See, just in terms of the, the aspiration of being a fair work nation, how do you feel about the prospect of, uh, you know, achieving the Scottish Government's target of 30,000 more people uh, earning a living wage, but there are still going to be 450,000 people not being paid a living wage? Surely Annabelle that Annabelle. is not consistent with a fair work nation ideal. Uh, excuse me for interrupting you, Mr Kelly. Annabelle Young. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, what I can say to the Member is, of course, that if the Labour Party had not blocked the devolution of employment powers to this Parliament, already the workers who have lost out as a direct result of the Labour Party's intransigence uh, would have seen their position uh, improved. Uh, Presiding Officer, more recently, the Fair Work Convention undertook an inquiry into fair work in social care and a report was published towards the end of February this year. Important concerns were raised about working terms and conditions and recommendations have been made to ensure that our vital workers in the care sector are treated Excuse me, Mrs. properly. Excuse me, Mrs. Ewing. It's very, very rude when someone is speaking to have cross-bench conversations going on. Thank you, Ms. Ewing. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I note that the Minister is currently reflecting on the report from Fair Work Convention on Social Care and I do look forward to receiving uh, his response and I do hope that it's a positive response and that it is a response in early course from the Scottish workers, uh, government because I would say that our social care workers are heroines and indeed for those men in the care sector, heroes. And they deserve to be treated better. Indeed, social care workers in my constituency of Cowden Beath and across Scotland will wish to know that the Scottish government continues to have their back just as it did when it ensured the payment of the living wage uh, to those care workers uh, with a relationship with local authorities. As far as the Fair Work Action Plan itself is concerned, important action points have been set forth, including, importantly, uh, a commitment, indeed, to increase the number of people who are paid the real living wage through the powers that we have, which is through basically encouragement and collaboration and partnership working, not the substantial powers 
of uh, employment that every other normal country would take for granted and would be able to do such, so much more with for the benefit of its workers. But a lot of good work has been done and of course there's always uh, more to do and the Scottish Government will continue its important partnership working with the Poverty Alliance to see the number of those receiving the living wage, real living wage in Scotland uh, boosted. Other commitments include the development of a fair work uh, framework benchmarking tool uh, and this of course will help uh, guide employers to assess their current practices and to see what more they can do. Another important action point concerns indeed the Scottish Business Pledge, which has been mentioned by uh, some members. Uh, a review of its operation was carried out in 2018 and the recommendations set forth reflect the uh, look at how it was operating practice. Obviously more needs to be done, but can I just maybe suggest gently that it would be incumbent on all of us individually as MSPs to do what we could also to advance the fair work agenda for workers in our constituencies and across uh, Scotland. Uh, the number of signatories indeed stands at around 600 and I'm sure that if we all put our hands to the wheel we could see that figure rise uh, considerably uh, because for the in, at the end of the day the message to get across to business is that treating your workforce properly is not only the right thing to do it is also the smart thing to do in order that that business can achieve its uh, potential. I believe that message is starting to get across but we all can do uh, so much more. Other key action points including creating a new online fair work service for small and micro employers so that they can access more easily the support and guidance that they may need, supporting trade unions to embed fair work in the workplace and encouraging the inclusion of a collective disputes procedure in construction contracts. Uh, also alongside the fair work action plan I think it is important to mention the gender pay gap action plan where we see some 50 recommendations uh, that will be required to be taken forward, including importantly a women's, uh, women returners programme to help those who have had a career break, a really innovative approach to trying to get these women back into work and looking also at flexible working practices, another important area uh, for particularly women in the workplace. In conclusion, presiding officer, a lot of work is going on uh, across the piece and I give credit to the Scottish Government for indeed driving this important agenda forward. As I say, it is being driven in the main by collaboration and encouragement because this parliament does not have powers over employment law. But just imagine, presiding officer, if this parliament did have such powers, how much more progress could be made over a much shorter period. Thank you, presiding officer. Just imagine how much easier my job would be if everyone would keep to six minutes. Bill Bowman, followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, deputy presiding officer. I welcome the chance to speak in this debate. I'm sure that there is a broad consensus across the chamber on the importance of fair work. However, we may not all agree that this fair work action plan is precisely the right way in which to do that. Nicola Sturgeon announced that by the end of this parliament, the Scottish government will extend the application of fair work criteria, including investment in skills and training, no exploitative zero hours contracts, action on gender pay, genuine workforce engagement, including with trade unions, and payment of the real living wage. The Fair Work Framework defines fair work as work that offers effective voice, respect, security, opportunity, and fulfillment. It balances the rights and responsibilities of employers and workers, and can generate benefits for individuals, organizations, and society. However, there is no single accreditation which reflects fair work in its entirety and public bodies and suppliers can support effective fair work practices without being accredited to any of these schemes. Over the last three years, about 600 businesses, I think that's the highest number we've had mentioned in the chamber today, um, have committed to the business pledge which celebrates companies that boost productivity and competitiveness through fair work values. In response to feedback from businesses, the reinvigorated business pledge retains payment of the living wage as a core commitment, while offering a more tailored approach to meet individual business needs. The Minister, as the Minister has mentioned, Dundee has become the first city in the UK to be awarded recognition for a plan to become a living wage city. Over 50 Dundee employers, including Dundee City Council, Explore Dundee, DC Thompson, and the Dundee and Angus Chamber of Commerce, have voluntarily committed to ensure all their staff and subcontracted staff receive a real living wage. I agree that as a responsible employers, we need to look at the impact of the living wage and do all we can to assess the implications and solutions. 
As this chamber is aware, Dundee has many industrial and construction-based employers based in the city, which are affected by issues of fair work procurement and competitive supply. The Scottish Government believes that contractors who go beyond minimum legal requirements by adopting fair work practices will increase innovation, improve workplace outcomes and business performance and can positively influence the delivery of a public contract. However, it is important to keep in mind that there may still be those who seek the cheapest, the cheapest solutions to problems. These can include cutting costs in the procurement stage of construction, which can cause problems which last the lifetime of a building and which can have an adverse effect on companies in Dundee, such as, as if they miss contracts due to having charged slightly more in order to comply and pay the living wage. Dundee's ambition to be a living wage city is very much a statement of intent, looking to double the number of workers covered by the Scottish living wage over the next three years. But the economic benefits of change must make a difference to everyone. However, this is not necessarily the case. Only last week I exposed the SNP for failing to help get older Dundee workers into new jobs following the collapse of large local employers such as Michelin and McGill's. I questioned the fairness of the Scottish Government's plans to only offer jobs grants to people aged 16 to 24 year old following such large job losses in Dundee. Dundee has the highest proportion of residents aged over 50 claiming out of work benefits, while it also has the lowest employment rate in Scotland overall. A living wage is all well and good, but when there are so many people who are out of work and therefore would not qualify for a living wage, there needs to be an emphasis on helping get people back into work and not solely on improving conditions for those who have a job already. The living wage employers already accredited in Dundee cover the equivalent of a quarter of all the workers in the city. However, the SNP administration leader admitted himself there is still more work to be done to encourage more employers to sign up. I welcome the general principles underpinning the Fair Work Action Plan. However, it is not enough to fix the underlying problems without getting people into work as a standalone plan. The UK unemployment rate has not been lower than it is now, not since December 1974. In addition, since 2010, more than 4 million of the lowest paid workers across the UK have received a higher and fairer share of their take home pay by being lifted out of tax altogether and having the right to keep more of their hard-earned money thanks to Conservative governments. This is not the case in Scotland. Workers in Scotland have the lowest wage growth in the UK and the lowest disposable incomes, but they are paying the highest levels of income tax in the UK. The SNP are also including ca increasing council tax and are trying to hit our hard-hit working population with additional taxes such as the car park tax. The Minister states in the foreword of the Fair Work Action Plan, we want Scotland to be the best place to live, work, invest and do business. If this were the case, then a starting point would be to take an illegal indirect two off the table and stick with the internationally recognised pound as a currency and address some of the hard economic realities the country is facing. Thank you. John Mason, followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be able to speak today on the Fair Work Action Plan. Following on the previous debate uh, in this chamber, which was on Thursday afternoon on the International Women's Day. And it seems to me that there is a clear link uh, between the two. We focused last week on fair treatment for women and today on fairer treatment for all staff. Since Thursday's debate, I had the opportunity to visit a local business on Friday as part of Scottish Apprenticeship Week. There we discussed the lack of women in a number of trades. And yesterday I was at Glasgow Caledonian University where they are also having a big push to change some of the gender stereotypes. And for example, encouraging more men into nursing with their program at GCU Men Are Nurses Too. We're not specifically focused on the gender pay gap today, and it's, but it is, specific, it is mentioned in the action plan. And I'm glad to see mentioned there in the summary. Publishing gender pay gap information has been a step in the right direction, but requiring employers to publish a gender pay gap action plan would definitely be a further step forward. I think we're seeing some of the more gentle side of the Conservatives today, but we know the reality is they've resisted uh, that kind of change. I do not believe we can achieve real progress on fair work generally if we do not deal with the unfair treatment of women in the workplace. 
One of the other points we discussed when I was at Cala University yesterday, and that they're keen to stress, is the important of e importance of ethos, both for themselves as an organisation, but we also talked, for example, about Social Security Scotland and the importance that it should have a different ethos from the DWP. And that can have huge ramifications throughout wider society, but it applies to other organisations as well. I note in the overview of actions, the point about instilling a fair work ethos in our future workforce and business leaders. Now, ethos, I think, is not an easy commodity to create or even to measure, but I do believe it is hugely important. And if we have the right ethos, we may not need to worry so much about all the detailed rules and regulations. Moving on to organizations having a flexible mindset, I think sometimes small employers can be nervous about increased regulation, for example, enforcing flexibility. A small shop or a small office, and in fact that includes ourselves who generally run small offices, which needs to open say nine to five for the sake of its customers, may feel it has little room to be flexible on staff working hours. We've discussed this in my office and we've found if there's willingness to come and go on both sides, we can come up with solutions such as a shorter a lunch hour and allowing somebody to leave early on one day each week. And that allows constituents to still have the same service that they need of maximum opening hours for my office. So I think we have to get the balance right between being fair to our customers or constituents who provide our income on the one hand, but also being fair to staff who work for us at the same time. Therefore, I very much welcome the commitment in the action plan to develop support during 2019 for small and micro employers. And it seems to me that just as the government and the public sector should set a good example, so should we as parliament and as MSPs. And I might just say in passing that sometimes there does seem to be quite a rigid top-down approach within parliament, eh, so that even though MSPs are individual employers eh, and with very different constituencies, there does seem to be a one-size-fits-all imposed, for example, the, the maximum hours or the uh, working hours for a full-time employee has been imposed at 35 hours. And I'm sure that was for good reasons, and I'm sure it should also protect MSP staff from exploitation. But I do think there needs to be a balance between imposing rigid rules and encouraging that positive ethos, which I mentioned earlier, and then allowing and encouraging both employers and employees to have a bit of flexibility um, and to discuss what is best for their individual situations. I mean, another situation was holidays, where the Parliament contract uh, suggests when holidays have to be taken. Now, moving on to the Labour Amendment, and particularly its emphasis on the real living wage, which Labour speakers have already uh, mentioned, I think most of us here support a real living wage, a wage that ordinary people can actually live on. However, it does strike me that Labour are very indirect in their approach, in that they are looking for all sorts of devices that we might use to ensure that the real living wage happens, but without actually being able to enforce it. For example, using the procurement process and Scottish Futures Trust, and I'm broadly in support of these. But we have debated this approach at length before, and clearly there is a legal tightrope to walk with European competition rules not allowing the mandating of such a non-statutory wage level in the procurement process. And I wonder why Labour would not just support full devolution of the statutory minimum wage. They must know that there would in all probability be agreement in this parliament for the statutory minimum. He's uh, in his last minute, just closing. Sorry, can't take it. Um, in this parliament for the statutory minimum wage to be brought up to the level of the living wage. Why is it then they, have the, they want the real powers to stay in London and just mitigate round the edges? Now, I certainly do welcome the commitment that grants from Scottish Enterprise will have a fair work criteria attached. I think we have felt in the past on the Economy Committee that Scottish Enterprise and others were very focused on attracting investment and jobs, but did not give enough emphasis to wage levels, inclusive employment, etc. <coughs> so in conclusion, I very much support this action plan. We need to realise we are in a long-term battle for fair work, eh, and there are few easy solutions, but I hope we're all committed to making progress. Thank you. Neil Finlay, followed by Stuart McMillan. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I want to declare an interest first as a member of Unite the Union and the EIS. Um, across Scotland, social division is growing. We see poverty increasing the gap uh, between the rich and poor expand. And for the first time in decades, life expectancy fall. These social divides are the consequence of economic uh, inequality and imbalance of power between 
uh, workers whose labour creates the wealth of the nation and those who hold shares and, spec or, and or speculate on the businesses uh, that employ them or indeed who own them. At the weekend, Richard Leonard rightly called for the devolution of employment law, but with a key caveat that we deploy a floor that means no Scottish Government could fall below what the UK Government does. And I think that's exactly right and would protect Scottish workers from any Scottish Government that sought to downgrade workers' rights. But we don't have to wait until devolution of powers to act. In many, many areas we can act now. Mr Hepburn asked if we, we would provide some uh, choices, some ideas. Well, let me run through a few for him. We could implement a living wage for all public contract, including those run by arm's length companies, because contract law has devolved, but it requires the political will to do so. I asked the minister why uh, the government opposed this during the passage of the public procurement bill, and like the famous two Ronnie sketch, he asked, answered a different question. Maybe he could answer <laughs> that question now. <laughs> Apparently not. Mr Mason said that, we, yes, certainly. Jamie so why did you oppose it last time? Well, I, I think the point has, of course, been made that there are strict confines within, within which we can operate under EU law. But Mr Finlay will understand and recognise that we have laid down significant statutory guidance and regulations to embed fair work in procurement. No other government's done that. He must surely welcome that. He, he mentions that you can't do it because of EU law, and yet the government claims it can do it when it implements it in social care. If it can do it in social care, why can we not do it Absolutely. across the piece? We could uh, refuse to give contracts to companies that fail to recognise trade unions because unionised workplaces are happier, they're safer, they're more productive and they're fairer. We could end the use of umbrella companies and public sector contracts and those involved in the Scottish Future Trust because umbrella companies rip off workers, they rip off the taxpayer and we should insist on direct employment rather than bogus self-employment. The government, ha government has de done very little, if anything, on bogus self-employment on its own projects also. We could stop main contractors ripping off subcontractors in public sector contracts. Like the case of Vaughan Engineering in my region, forced to close after 60 years with the loss of 300 jobs because of the outrageous behaviour of a main contractor. We could insist that trade unions get access to organise on projects financed by public money, like could have happened on the Dumfries Hospital, but the trade unions were told to stay off. We could refuse to give contracts to those who have blacklisted workers, like we could have done at the VNA and Dundee, yeah. had the government followed its own guidance yeah. and yet it ignored it on that contract. We could end the outsourcing and the privatisation racket, which saw the likes of Karelian fail, leaving jobs unfinished and thousands out of work. We could assist, insist on apprenticeships and training being a condition of contract and that a training officer is employed in major contracts. This was offered on the Queen's Ferry Crossing, but wasn't enacted. We could regulate electricians, and I've had the discussion with Mr Hepburn on that, and uh, uh, the discussions we had were positive. Uh, and I think that would protect uh, the trade, avoid consumers being ripped off, and promote good health and safety. And I look forward to uh, significant progress uh, on that. We could put fair work conditions on the award of all grants to companies like Kayam and introduce conditionality on the small business bonus with employers uh, who advance the fair work agenda rewarded. We could legislate for collective bargaining, not just to promote it. We could end the use of zero hours contracts and uh, public contracts and in the public sector, including in colleges and universities. We could expand the number of employees registered as living wage employers. Uh, out of 340,000 registered businesses, only 1,300 are living wage employers, and only 600 have signed the business pledge. We have a massive way to go on this. We're only scratching at the surface. We could accept the request by Scottish Care and Unison to implement collective bargaining. When I chaired the health committee, we had both sides of the sector asking for to implement collective bargaining. And when I asked the then health secretary, Shona Robinson, why they wouldn't do it, she said, we've never been asked. That is pretty pathetic. We should do that because there's a crisis in social care, an employment crisis there, and both sides believe collective bargaining is a way to resolve that. 
We could end the cuts to Scotland Council, Scotland's councils that have seen 40,000 jobs lost. We could end the cuts to Scotland's colleges and deliver promises on lecturers' pay. We could bring the railways back into public ownership and ban the dumping of human waste on tracks that workers have to deal with. The Parliament could... You, there is no cost. We let the contract expire and you break ScotRail's contract, which is an absolute disaster, Mr Lyle. The Parliament could unanimously, could unanimously support Claire Baker's corporate homicide bill to hold directors account, to account for decisions that cause the death of their employees. We could stop giving public money to companies that systematically avoid paying their taxes. We could recognise and act on the he mental health crisis, especially in services and jobs where stress levels are high, providing access to counselling. And we could please. end the exploitation of workers, especially young workers, with the government eh, eh, exposing those who are exploiting staff, like the cases eh, that have been unearthed by Better Than Zero. These are all things we could do. Come to They're all things please. we should do. And I hope the Minister's got enough ideas there for them to take forward. Stuart McMillan, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I welcome this debate and also the actions, including in the Fair Work Action Plan, and also welcome the Scottish Government's decision to instigate this plan, but more importantly, the collaborative approach that's actually been taken in delivering it. But the motion in uh, Richard, sorry, the amendment in Richard Leonard's name states that it's, uh, and I quote, it's not bold enough in its ambitions. Now, the, certainly, the Labour Party in Scotland are perfectly entitled to, to hold that view, but for a party that was in power in Scotland for eight years, uh, power in Westminster for 13 years, and led various councils uh, for decades that led to equal pay claims aplenty, then I think it's a bit rich to cry the crocodile tears at this stage. Uh, I suppose, however, that the first stage in redemption is for an organisation to admit that it actually has a problem. So if this is their admission, uh, they, they might manage to put together some type of a coherent message at some point in the, in the very distant future. Neil Finlay. Since he's on that theme, maybe Mr McMillan will apologise for his own party's MPs not turning up when the UK Parliament voted to introduce the minimum wage. Maybe he'll take his opportunity to apologise for that. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Neil Finlay needs to look at his own party, uh, first of all, because it's certainly something... Well, clearly he doesn't actually want to admit his, his party actually has had problems and still does have many problems. Uh, and clearly that's why they will be, no doubt, in third place in this parliament for many, many decades to come. Presenting officer, whilst more can always be done, and whether it's in this issue or health services or human rights uh, and, the, and the fact of every aspect of life, it's important to acknowledge that hard work and steps have been deployed to deliver this plan. It's also important to recognise that, as the Minister said earlier, that employment law is still reserved to the Westminster Parliament. So this Scottish Government is trying to do a job with one hand tied behind its back. Now, so, so I actually want, to, I want Scotland to be the best place to live, to work, to be invested in, to do business, but also uh, in terms of leisure activities. Now, we live in a wonderful country, but, but the full potential of our outputs has still to be achieved. But that's about that continual improvement. Now, I welcome the Scottish Government motion, and in particular the, the following part, and that's the aspect of that endorses the actions that it commits the Scottish Government to. Now, it's, it's absolutely crucial to appreciate that for the action plan to be successful, then the full range of partners need to play their part. Now, this is where the, the Fair Work Convention and that was that the partnership between businesses, trade unions, the public sector and academics was so, so important. And the Fair Work Framework published in 2016 creates that definition of fair work as work that offers all individuals an effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfilment and respect. Now, I wouldn't imagine anybody in this chamber or in Scotland would actually be against that definition. I believe that, that Scotland is making strides in fair work. And I certainly will underpin our economic success, as well as the well-being and prosperity of our people, our communities, and also business. But what's not to like about that? Now, presenting officer, many MSPs are already living wage accredited employers. There are 14 accredited employers in my constituency, but I'm quite sure that there will be many more who actually haven't yet obtained the accreditation, but they actually are delivering upon uh, what a living wage employer actually means. Of the 14 uh, in the Inverclyde Local Authority area, 
We've got three private sector, three charity, two transport, two housing, one care, sorry, two care, one local authority, and also one arts and culture. Now, I'm pleased that Inverclyde is actually playing its part in obtaining accreditation. With the, with the 1,000 target already being exceeded uh, to over 1,300, it's clear that, that businesses recognise the importance of being a living wage employer. Now, certainly some uh, MSPs today have, have been quite critical on the fact that uh, there's 1,300. But that 1,300 is actually it's, it's a third of actually what was going on across the UK. And living wage, uh, the Living Wage um, Foundation have actually praised what's going on in Scotland. So I think it's a bit rich also for MSPs to actually talk Scotland down when actually Scotland is, is, is delivering way beyond its percentage share within uh, the UK. Now, it's, it's surely incumbent upon all of us to encourage more businesses in our areas to sign up to become living wage employers. I'm also delighted that, that there's about 601 businesses have signed up to the Scottish Business Pledge. Now, I do, I do admit and acknowledge that more needs to be done in this area as well. This is where, once again, MSPs have got a role to play to actually encourage businesses in their areas, their constituencies and regions, to actually play their part to make their communities better. Now, I'm equally delighted that the Scottish Government have introduced statutory guidance uh, on addressing uh, fair work practices, including the real living wage and procurement uh, and, and supporting best practice guidance and the toolkit. Now, presenting also close the gap sent MSPs a briefing uh, highlighting uh, some aspects I'm about today now, actually, where did it made it this year? Now, they, they, they sent this, uh, this briefing, uh, and, uh, and there's one, actually, one part of this, uh, of the briefing, which I thought was really, uh, was really kind of enlightening, that was the aspect of the unpaid care. Now, I'll just quote this one aspect, it's, and they state, the action plan states, uh, one in seven Scots uh, are unpaid carers, and many carers give up work because the job of juggling their work and caring responsibilities simply becomes too much. Now, the Minister spoke in his uh, opening contribution regarding uh, learning lessons when he spoke of the, the Fair Work Summit that, uh, that's going to be taking place uh, later on. Now, I, I'm sure, however, the Minister will have been interested in the reports in the media this morning uh, regarding the, the issue of the implementation of the Carers Scotland Act 2016 uh, and monies apparently been spent inconsistently by councils since the Act came into force last year. Now, clearly, carers... Sure. Clearly, carers uh, have enough challenges to contend with, uh, and with that, I, also, uh, I, will, uh, uh, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And before I commence, can I refer members to my register of interest as a business owner and employer? Now, look, I have no doubt that everyone participating in this debate accepts that fair work helps to deliver sustainable and inclusive growth. And certainly, as an employer, I would absolutely um, commend some of the things in the action report. But I think, as businesses listening to this kind of debate, they could be forgiven for, for disengaging with some of this. Because at the end of the day, this is not about whether you have a, a sign on your door that accredits you with some scheme. It's about how you treat your employees, how you operate your business, and in doing so, how you improve your position in your marketplace. So I think we need to be careful not to forget that actually business themselves drive what they do in their businesses, not the labels that government put on them. So we've already held quite a lot of um, contributions to that effect. And I'm going to try and not repeat some of the things we've heard already today. But I want to um, touch on, on a couple of areas that I want to explore that have come up for me in the last couple of weeks. Um, but I will start by saying that I do welcome the plan. Um, there's quite a lot in there. A lot of it is words um, and needs to be padded out a bit with actions. Um, but I want to hear really the Minister's thoughts on a couple of things that I'm going to talk about now. So the first is that we learned at the start of this month that the Scottish Government's flagship work programme, Fair, Stop, Fair Start Scotland, is failing to meet the Scottish Government's targets. So the work programme was devolved to the Scottish Parliament in 2016. And I do believe it was a chance to create a bold, new, tailored programme optimised for Scotland. So I hope, therefore, that the Minister will share my concern that almost half of referred job seekers are not accessing Fair Start Scotland. And whilst I do accept that these individuals can often be those who struggle to engage with the world of work and the steps to enter the workforce, it does compare poorly to the current reserved UK programme where 75% of all individuals referred have started the scheme. 
So you've set a target, the SNP have set a target of 38,000 people to pass through Fair Start Scotland in three years. And the trajectory is that if things continue on their current path, you will fall short of that target by 10,000 participants. And clearly, um, to develop a fair work economy, the engagement needs to be active between employers, employees, and government policy. So, you know, I'll be looking forward to, to some retort on that. You can give it now if you like, yep. Jamie Hepburn. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if Ms Ballantyne would uh, think that part of a fair work agenda would be compelling people to take part in such a programme at threat of being sanctioned and losing benefit entitlement as was the case under the watch of the Department of Work and Pensions. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, I think that's a slightly conflated question. Um, I think what you're trying to do is get people to engage proactively with a Fair Start work programme. Um, and uh, clearly at the moment, it, it, it's only having a 50% success rate. What I'm looking for from you is how you think we can improve that, because that's the really important thing here. Um, Government policy impacts on the quality of the workforce coming forward for employers. And this is the second part I want to ask about today or get your thoughts on today. Because as an employer, when we're looking for good quality employees and employees that can contribute to a business uh, and improve a business's output, which in turn allows the business to afford better conditions, better wages, etc., so today we see in the news again, evidence was given to the Education Committee by Professor Jim Scott, highlighting Scottish Government figures showing the proportion of leavers with no exam passes has risen from 1.5% in 2012-13, the year before the current curriculum was brought in, to 2.3% last year. And the figure has more than quadrupled from 1% to 4.5% in Dumfries and Galloway, and surged to 3.7% in Midlothian. So I am actually quite concerned then that if the SNP wants Scotland to be a prosperous, world-leading country, which of course it's not just you that wants that, I think everybody in this chamber is looking for that, then they, you must be able to revitalise the economy. And the first step on that road is to ensuring that we have the workforce that Scotland needs. So, I would like your sort of thoughts on that, because if we don't start with a good baseline of, of youngsters coming out of school with decent qualifications, or some qualifications, which is the problem we seem to have at the moment, then it's difficult for, for businesses to then be looking to pay more, have better conditions, um, and, and they're going to be looking outside, and I think then our, our youngsters lose out. My second sort of big point, the third, in fact, big point that I want to talk about is the role that older people have to play breathing life into Scotland's economy. So we learned yesterday from Census Wide Scotland that one in three Scots fear that they will have to continue working to make ends meet. Not only that, more than half of Scots do not have any plans to financially support themselves in retirement, instead relying on the state pension. Many people will have to keep working after 65. In fact, half of older people over that age are still working, and we need to support and utilise their skills. So Scotland has a huge wealth of older talent ready to be unlocked, but nevertheless, it seems to be underutilised. I know my colleague Bill Bowman touched upon this earlier today, um, and in recent weeks, I've been hearing it myself from employment professionals across the borders. Many older people do actually want to work, but they are struggling sometimes to find a place in the labour market that is increasingly youth orientated but would nevertheless benefit from their experience. So there are many projects now in place to help young people develop and to get into work, such as the job grant or the modern apprenticeship scheme. But have you given any thought to what about the close, same opportunities please. for older people? So I'll wind up there with four, four, three things for you to answer, but I'd be grateful for them. Thank you. Can I have Richard Lyle, please, followed by James Kelly. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by uh, my welcoming the opportunity to contribute to the Scottish Government debate on Fair Work Action Plan. When I was campaigning for election as a constituency MSP for Erdington and Belsill, I made my campaign focus on the issue of what I called jobs, jobs, jobs. Recognising the absolute need to work to support an environment in a local area that created jobs, brought an investment, delivered opportunities to deliver skills, develop skills with our young people in particular. One such example of a business that is doing that is Saltire Heating Systems in my constituency. 
I visited them um, just last week for Apprentice Week and had the chance to hear from young workers about their plans for the futures, future, what they thought about their opportunities and their vision. Of course, naturally, jobs, jobs, jobs is only one element of ensuring good working practice gets created. With jobs, jobs, jobs should always come fairness and equality. And that's what I believe this Scottish SNP government are working hard to deliver. President officer, I welcome the publication of the Fair Work Action Plan and endorse the action that it commits the Scottish Government to do. In doing so, I recognise and share the vision for Scotland to be a fair work nation by 2025. And we will do so by recognising the important and vital role that employers and trade unions have in creating fairer workplaces and by acknowledging also the crucial work of fair work in developing sustainable and inclusive growth. President officer, I believe the SNP and this Scottish Government are clear. We want Scotland to be the best place to live, work, invest and do business. Our plan delivers on this ambition. And Fair Work is the foundation for this plan. Indeed, a prerequisite for it to happen is a sustainable way. What is Fair Work, though? That's a question that many ask. And in order to deliver it, we must establish what it looks like. The Fair Work Convention, a partnership of businesses, trade unions, public sector, academics based at the University of Strathclyde, published its Fair Work Framework in 2016. It defines its Fair Work as work that offers all individuals an effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfilment and respect. That's Fair Work in a nutshell. President officer, we on this bench believe that Scotland can make strides in Fair Work that will underpin pin our economic success as well as the well-being and the prosperity of our people, communities and business. Fair Work has been an important part of Scotland's gov Scot Scottish Government inclusive, inclusive growth agenda. From the publication by the Scottish Government of its Fair Work Action Plan on 27th of February, it sets out the Government's plans for Scotland to be a world-leading Fair Work nation by 2025, as I have highlighted. It rightly includes a range of measures to support employers to embed fairer working practices. And while more can be done, we should recognise some of the fantastic progress that has been made so far, including meeting and exceeding our target of 1,000 Scots-based Scots living wage accredited employers, now over 1,300. And I'm proud that many of my colleagues and here and I here in this Parliament are showing leadership on this issue. Introducing statutory guidance and addressing fair work practices, including the real living wage, procurement and supporting best practice guidance and toolkit. Introducing the Workplace Equality Fund to deliver employer-led innovation solutions to overcome workplace inequality. Introducing the Women's Returners programmes to assist women to re-enter the workplace following a career break. Establishing a carer positive scheme to encourage flexible, fair and supportive policies to support carers in the workplace. Promoting development of flexible workplaces through continual funding of Family Flexible Working Scotland. President officer, I could go on and on, but this short list demonstrates quite effectively our record on working to equalise, create a fair and equitable approach to work. And it is important to recognise that all of this is being done within the context of employment law being reserved to the UK government. So the SNP and government in Scotland is doing all it can with the powers available to promote fair work practices. As with so many issues, this is a record with devolution. Imagine the potential we could have to deliver our great nation with the powers of independence. No, I don't have time. And this SNP government is not only one for resting on its laurels, and more can and will be done. I note there are many plans to fulfil collaboration with the Fair Work Convention to organise and host an international Fair Work Summit in 2019-20. This summit will showcase Scotland's approach to Fair Work on international stage, making connections across a Fair Work movement in Scotland, UK and Europe. In government, our approach to delivering Fair Work is built on collaboration, engagement and using our wider powers and policies to exert strategic influence. The Bank Government's Action Plan seeks to deliver fair work to a diverse and inclusive workforce, and many proposed actions highlight current and planned work of Scottish Government and stakeholders, including the STUC Fair Work Convention, the Poverty Alliance to address 
challenges to del deliver fair work in specific sectors. Scottish Government, I believe, will extend the Workplace Equality Fund to align with the Fair Work First Commitment, continue to support strong trade unions, promote collective bargaining, promote fair work in the collaborative economy, take forward actions related to the Fair Work Convention Social Work Report, increase the number of people employed who are paying, paid the real living you wage must and please. secure <coughs> work. And I commend this motion. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I call James Kelly to be followed by Bill Kidd. Mr Kelly, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I think this is actually a very timely debate um, because it's now nearly five years since the Procurement Scotland Bill was passed by this Parliament. Uh, and one of the big debates on that bill was the mandating of the living wage in public procurement contracts. So I think it's worthwhile to reflect uh, back on that uh, debate, not to, to go over the debate again, but to then look five years down the line and to examine the, you know, what progress there's been. So going back to, 2000 and, uh, going back to 2014, uh, Labour obviously argued for mandating of the payment of the living wage in all public contracts. The government, again, as we've heard in these benches this afternoon, um, well, we're very keen on it, but you know, just couldn't do it. it. Would be breaking EU law. It was all very difficult. Um, I think that was a bit of a red herring at the time, and as Mr. Finlay pointed out, in terms of uh, how it's been laid out in the care sector, clearly uh, it was a red herring. But what the government then said was that we're really keen in payment and living wage, and we'll make sure that the guidelines are really strong and it's made clear to people in, co in our public contracts have been set out that the, the expectation is that the living wage should be paid. So how has how that gone? Um, if you go back to, to 2015, there were 460,000 people in Scotland um, who have not been paid the real living wage. And today, that figure is 480,000. So sadly, the situation has deteriorated in terms of people being paid the, the real living wage. Yes, yeah, sure. Minister? I mean, the figures he's provided are not inaccurate, of course, uh, President Officer, and we must do more. But he would accept, as a proportion, it has fallen because there are actually more people in employment today. So there are actually also more people earning above the real living wage as well, just to put it in its proper context. James Kelly. <laughs> I've got to say, you Minister, I think you're dancing on the head of your pin. The reality is there are 20,000 people more uh, not, who are on poverty wages, not been paid the real living wage than they were in 2015. And I'm outlining this simply to say, you know, going back, going back five years, we've not made, as a parliament and a government, we've not made the progress that we should have done. If you listen to some of the speeches that were made back in 2014, and that's backed up by, you know, examining the, the Fair Work Action Plan. As many have said, you know, only 601 employers, 0.55 per cent, have signed up to, to the business pledge. Um, and no more... more um, no, I want to make some progress. No, I want to make, I want to make some progress. Uh, I'll let you in later on if I, uh, if I get a chance. Uh, nowhere is the situation more stark in the city of Glasgow that I represent. 150,000 uh, people in Glasgow not been paid the, the real living wage. And as the Poverty Alliance pointed out in their briefing for the debate, you know, even if we, you know, we're able to make some progress on that, uh, with a quarter of them, 37,500 people, if, if you're able to make that progress, then that would be boost the Glasgow economy by £27 million. And it would also increase tax revenues coming in um, to the Scottish Government by £16 million. So there are real uh, advantages in that. I think the other thing in Glasgow I would say is that, the, as well as poverty wages, there's a tie-in to, sadly, exploitation. Um, you know, I'm aware of... Uh, two examples in terms of retail stores in Glasgow. You know, one that runs uh, relatively short fixed term contracts and changes the hours about uh, in order to suit the flow of business. And that sometimes can mean people working full time hours and then getting cut to maybe 25 hours. And that 
is a real problem if you're, you know, having to, you know, pay bills and, you know, run a house, etc. I'm also aware of one other uh, large retail store where someone was on a, a so-called probationary contract and they only knew that they weren't being continued in that probationary contact, contract uh, when they got a P45 through the post. So I think there's a lot more the Scottish Guard. These are main, main organisations as well. I think there's a lot more. No, no, I want to, I've only, no, I, I've only got a minute to, make, to, to speak and there's some points I want to make. I'm very calm, Mr. Lyle. Um, the, so, well, well it, 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 if, if you think it's, it's funny to ignore the fact that 150,000 people in the, in the city that you represent aren't being paid the real living wage, then that's treating, that's treating a lot of your constituents with contempt, Mr. Doris. In terms of moving this issue forward, there's two specific things the Scottish Government should be doing. Five years down the line, they should be making payment of the living wage mandatory in all public uh, procurement contracts. Um, it should have been done five years ago, but let's, let's do it now. The other thing is, uh, you know, we talk about fair work in this debate. Let's have fair taxation. We've just passed a taxation policy that hands tax cuts to lawyers and P45 to librarians. If you're really talking about tackling poverty, you can't have a taxation policy that gives 99% of taxpayers, including all those earning up to 124,430 uh, a tax cut. So it needs a, a, a fundamental rethink of the government's approach in both of these areas. And I'll end on that point, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Bill Kidd to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Mr Kidd, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank the Minister for outlining the Fair Work Action Plan today and for highlighting the importance of centering fair work at the core of the Scottish economy. As the plan points out, fair work drives success, well-being and prosperity for individuals, businesses, organisations, and in fact, for everyone in society. And fair work means treating people with dignity and respect, the effect of which is to improve staff motivation and retention. Moreover, this core value underpins sustainable and successful businesses. Presiding officer, what I will focus on today is the opportunities dimension of the Fair Work Framework. In particular, I want to look at how refugees have the opportunity to access Fair Work. The opportunities dimension states that it is reasonable aspiration for, to want work that is fair and for Fair Work to be available for everyone. Fair opportunity allows people to access good work and employment and is a crucial dimension of Fair Work. I want to emphasise the role that employers can play in ensuring that fair opportunities are provided to refugees. In Scotland, we have made it our prerogative to welcome refugees. We have offered a new place to start over and make beautiful Scotland their new home. For new Scots, a priority is finding community and becoming integrated into Scottish life. Integration through getting into work holds relevance as a topic in the debate today, I believe. Refugees often face unique barriers to accessing work that councils, employers, government and parliament should all be aware of. The Fair Work Action Plan, I believe, offers an opportunity for employers to consider these unique challenges and consequently how they can create fair opportunities. I would urge the Scottish Government to assess how their particular challenges can be incorporated into the benchmarking tool so that the needs of refugees are benefited. Charities like the Scottish Refugee Council, the Refugee Survival Trust, the Bridges Programme and others are doing incredible work. Whilst refugee charities can provide greater expertise, I will do my best to reflect on three barriers. The first is an obvious point, but nonetheless significant. A key factor in helping refugees get a job is first having the appropriate mastery of the English language. Welsh refugees are offered free ESOL uh, lessons. Opportunities to learn out of the classroom are really extremely valuable. Ongoing research is being conducted by the University of Edinburgh and it suggests that short-term placements, such as volunteering one day a week, can make a tremendous impact in this regard. Experience like this could help accelerate learning whilst also building connections in with the community. Councils could encourage local employers or public services such as libraries to help. 
all the while many refugees do have the language skills required to work. In such cases, they need to be offered the opportunity to work. And this is my second point. An excellent example of local employers offering fair opportunities is through the Bridges programme located in Glasgow. The Bridges programme helps refugees with their equipped for the future course, helping them understand their skills from their experience and translate that into a CV, completing applications and interview preparation. Amongst other things, the Bridges programme offers short work experience opportunities with Glasgow-based companies. These normally last for 12 days, spread over a couple of months, and often do lead to a job offer. The second point weaves into my third one. Often when refugees apply for work, their qualifications and experience are not recognised. This may be due to paperwork being lost that could prove ability and proficiency for working in a specific field. Often people who have had 30 year long careers are required to retrain before they can enter the same or related field once again. Many refugees face challenges like this. What I think would be helpful in such circumstances, particularly for regulated fields that require qualifications here in Scotland, would be accelerated programmes that help refugees enter back into their professions here in Scotland. This would be beneficial to us all as it would enrich our workforce and utilise people's skills and expertise. At the same time, it would also provide fair access to work for a group of new Scots facing unique challenges. The Scottish Government has funded a new Refugee Doctors Project with NHS uh, Education for Scotland and the Bridges Programme, BMA, Clyde College in my Annie's Land constituency and the City of Glasgow College. Refugee doctors are given support to obtain a level 7.5 IELTS English language proficiency at the Annie's Land campus of Clyde College. They then assist with steps to obtaining a license to work as a doctor here in the UK. Indeed, just last year, because of the Refugee Doctors Project, NHS Scotland started four refugee doctors working here. This comprehensive programme shows how tailored support can address the unique challenges faced by refugees in returning to their professions. Whilst each industry will have different requirements, this type of programme shows that fair opportunities, even in the most difficult of circumstances, can be provided. Whether a farmer, pilot, engineer, teacher or nurse, new Scots do share a desire to contribute to Scottish life and build a home for themselves here. Aligning the fair work framework with, to help employers consider refugees and recognise their previous work experience would be highly valuable and I hope the Scottish Government can pursue this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was beginning to wonder the connection with the motion, but there is a connection with the motion. Worthy though the speech was, I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Doris is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I too would like to thank the Minister for bringing forward this important debate today. And in my speech, I would like to touch on some of the actions included in the Disability Employment Delivery Plan, one for a suitable labour market plan that forms the Fair Work Action Plan. I would also like to refer to some of the observations I have made having met with disabled people, disabled organisations, employers to discuss disability employment. It is estimated that there are 264,000 disabled workers in Scotland. Despite the employment rate improving and the advent of the Equality Act, there is still a significant difference in the number of disabled people in employment, 42% compared to the overall figure of 73.4%. Disabled people, like most people, see the importance of work as a source of income, something to do for their own well-being, and as a way for people to feel they are contributing to society. Yet many disabled people and those with long-term health conditions, learning disabilities or mental health issues still face particular and complex barriers to staying in employment, such as uh, societal employer attitudes and lack of confidence and even low expectations from family and society. Within the business community, I have found unanimous support for the recruitment of disabled people. 
rather than viewing the employment of a disabled person as a diversity box ticking exercise, employers see an opportunity to increase the pool of candidates within a business. They recognise that reflecting the diversity a customer base within the workforce can help in maintaining a long-term offer that people buy into more easily. However, all accept that there is much more that needs to be done to narrow the disability employment gap. Employers acknowledge that while at a leadership level there is support for the business to, to be more inclusive, more steps still need to be taken and embedded that this aspiration mindset can go down to line managers and others who do the day-to-day -day recruiting. I find agreement amongst employers that the diversity and the language surrounding disability can be intimidating for a hiring manager who is concerned they may offend. This view is supported by recent research conducted by Leonard Chesler, which found that 24 per cent of employers said they would be less likely to employ someone with a disability. Employers agree that this reluctance identifies a need to improve education and training within the workforce and to promote role models within the workforce with disabilities. Disability organisations tell me there needs to be better support provided for, for both disabled people looking for employment and for employers. One disability charity spoke about employer ability, suggesting we need to consider how we show, support businesses to make a mainstream approach to recruitment more inclusive and fairer than, rather than seeing the disabled person as a problem. Employers tell me that the split in employment between legislation between Westminster and the Scottish Government does create complexity. Employers refer to a crowded landscape and I do hope that the Scottish Government will work closely with Westminster. For example, why not have one website with all the information from UK Government and Scottish Government rather than separate ones that should cause confusion? I would encourage the Scottish Government, as outlined in the Disability Employment Action Plan, to actively promote DWP's Access to Work Scheme to employers and disabled people. Through the scheme, disabled people can claim up to almost £60,000 per year to help pay for additional support that they may need in the workplace. This can include workplace adaptations, technology, transport, interpreters, all of them which can make a viable difference for a disabled person remaining in employment. Disabled charities also have stressed the need for appropriate in-work support to enable a disabled person to carry out their job. I was therefore very concerned when I saw recently figures published revealing that 45% of jobless individ individuals referred to Fair Start Scotland did not take part in the Back to Work scheme. The Scottish Government took charge of the Employment Support Service back in April 2017, claiming the service would offer high quality in-work support to those who require it to help them find work. I am concerned that disabled people are being let down due to the lack of support. The SNP must pick up the pace and make sure people getting back to work have the support and opportunities they need. A young disabled woman recently spoke to me that she was desperate to get real work. Real work, not a job designed for disabled people, but a job that she could have flexible hours in with an employer that understood her needs. Deputy Presiding Officer, government leadership is important to ensure disabled people can expect the same opportunities for care or progression as non-disabled people. Until we see that 20% figure reached, amongst disabled people, then we should never rest and we should continue to work hard to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Bob Doris and then we move to closing speeches. Mr Doris, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'd like to initially highlight an aspect of fair work that I believe has been addressed successfully very recently in Glasgow. As the Chamber will know, Glasgow City Council has ended long-standing injustices since the SNP took over the Council administration in 2017. I would like to outline this but draw it back to the relevance of fair work across Scotland and the government's policy to secure that. 
women who were structurally discriminated against for far too long in our city by a previous Labour administration. Quite frankly, women who did, who did a fair day's work but simply did not get a fair day's pay. They were discriminated on two fronts. Firstly, by being denied equal pay by the previous administration. And secondly, women were forced to fight for years through the courts and were denied justice and the money they were rightly owed. That was not fair work. This has now been rectified by Glasgow City Council agreeing to pay £500 million to settle the long run equal pay dispute, putting thousands of historically low paid women in line for an average payout of £35,000. I pay tribute to the women who won that fight and to Councillor Susan Aiken for the leadership that everyone showed. Yeah, yeah. But I actually want to acknowledge Richard Leonard. Uh, he said last year that there was too much legal obstruction in relation to that matter regarding the fight for equal pay in Glasgow, effectively admitting that Labour were on the wrong side of the argument and also saying, and for that, I think we owe those women an apology. Uh, that was gracious. Uh, I suspect that the previous Labour administration found the equal pay issue simply too challenging to tackle, if I'm being quite honest about it. However, in relationship to Glasgow's equal pay settlement, it shows that even the most intractable challenges regarding fair work can be solved and we can end discrimination with will and determination. It's vital then that when we talk about fair work that we try where possible to come together out with party political boundaries. And I'm going to very briefly name check uh, Mr Kelly here with a to and fro during his speech. I'm going to come back to uh, low paid workers in Glasgow. I promise you I will do that um, to show that I'm taking the issue seriously. Uh, so it is vital that we try to do things uh, on a bipartisan basis uh, where possible. In doing so, I want to refer to some of the matters that Mr Rennie raised. Effectively, what we can do to encourage more companies to sign the Scottish Business Pledge. Uh, that's a reasonable question to ask. Even I think Mr Rennie's choice of language may not have been aimed at getting a consensus, but I do think it was a very fair line of questioning for Mr Len Rennie to pursue. Uh, I want more businesses to sign the pledge, and Mr Rennie focused on the largest companies in Scotland, but I would like to focus on smaller businesses. The majority, 65.7% of signatory businesses, were small, are small, employing less than 50 people. However, the small firms make up 96.3% of firms within the Scottish economy. Proportionately, actually, more medium and large firms have signed up to the pledge, and these firms share uh, the and these firms share of the Scottish business base. So disproportionately small businesses are not signing up. Therefore, I'd be keen to learn more about how the Scottish Government will encourage small businesses to work towards signing that pledge. If I think of the small businesses in Mary Hill and Springburn constituency that I represent, their time is very precious. precious. They also don't have personnel that they can free up to align to that business pledge. However, they may very well be willing and if it, is made not, if it is made more convenient to sign up uh, and they get some specific support to help to meet some of the criteria, they may very well do so. I would therefore be keen to identify fair work champions who can offer uh, not just publicising the scheme, but offer practical and business support to assist these small businesses to, play the real, to pay the real living wage and the compliance necessary to sign the Scottish business press. Quite frank frankly, businesses may have to review, revise and adapt their medium-term business plans if they are to sign up to that business pledge. And that's particularly challenging for small businesses. Now, if you go online and you look to sign up to that business pledge uh, and you click on the, 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 the correct uh, icon, it says, thank you for your interest in the Scottish business pledge. To make a commitment, your company mu must have offices and staff based in Scotland to pay the real living wage. And it goes on and it, it says to you that you must, you must pay the real living wage and then it says you must, you must commit to two of another eight outcomes that you must achieve and you must work your way towards achieving the other six. That can be quite burdensome for a, a small company that wants to do the right thing that employs five or six people and are, are just making ends meet. Uh, we have to get them into a financial position where they can, they, they can sign that pledge or work themselves towards signing that pledge because it will actually make them more financially stable as well. So in relation to Glasgow, for example, uh, Mr Kelly, I, I think it would be good if we had those champions in Glasgow supporting the small businesses that we, we both want to support and we want to actually pay uh, the real living wage to. I think that would be an important thing to do. And in the time I've got left, which I know is very brief, uh, President Officer, let me just say two of the things that companies might really value in doing, because it's not as intimidating as it, as it first looked. One of the themes you could sign up to is to invest in youth. 
and, and some of the examples given actually are, are quite practical uh, and it's enter into partnership with local schools or regional colleges, influence the development of young influence the development of young people in education, input into careers guidance are just three of the examples given. That is doable with a little bit of help and a nudge in the right direction. Uh, and there's, there's also information there about how you might want to meet the community's outcome, which talks about supporting formal community activities and supporting volunteering opportunities within the community for your workforce. So there's two things I think most businesses could be in compliance with, with a little bit of help and get themselves onto that Scottish business pledge. I think if we do work across party uh, and right, right across this chamber, we can do much more to uh, uh, necessitate fair work that we all want to see, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Closing speeches, I call Alison Johnson to close the Green Party. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, this has been a broad debate today and it's touched upon some of the key issues impacting people who, who are working. Um, we heard Richard Leonard welcome the Fair Work Agreement. I think it's fair to say probably not a lot else. Um, Willie Rennie, I thought very thoughtfully highlighted the important role of employment in reducing, in addressing and reducing offending and how we might tie this into fair work. And I think Willie Rennie's focus on the business pledge demonstrates why a voluntary approach alone cannot deliver fair work. Um, John Mason spoke of the need to close the gender pay gap and requiring employers to publish their plans to address this. And Bill Kidd highlighted the barriers facing refugees and organisations working to address these barriers. Now, Neil Finlay was um, right to highlight dwindling life expectancy. Um, and Stuart McMillan's highlighting of the excellent briefing from Close of the Gap was very welcome, as was his focus on unpaid care. Um, undoubtedly, it is the case that women remain primary carers and there are you know, difficulties in, ban in balancing unpaid care with work. Um, and perhaps it's not surprising then that 50% of employees on zero hour contract are women. So we need to look at how flexible employment uh, where that is the case, is, is fair work too. Only 6% of jobs paying £20,000 or more are advertised on a flexible basis. Close the gap, tell us that in their briefing for today. Um, Michelle Ballantyne says there is m more, I'm perhaps paraphrasing, but there's more to fair work than sticking a living wage sticker on our windows. And of course there is, but um, by all means, do those other important things, but let's all get to a situation where we can all claim rightly um, the right to have that living wage employer sticker on our windows. I'm very pleased to have one of those. It is the case that the government's Fair Work Action Plan marks important progress. More employers pay the living wage in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK at 80.6% compared with 77.1% south of the border. Bill Bowman spent some time highlighting Fair Work Action in Dundee a city set to become the first real living wage city in the UK, with 50 employers increasing their hourly wages. And I hope that many across Scotland will follow their lead, including here in Edinburgh. The Fair Work Action Plan also commits to taking forward a series of initiatives that will put the pressure on many businesses to adopt ethical employment standards. Greens welcome that Fair Work First criteria will be applied to government business support, including grants and loans by the end of this parliament. And I would be very grateful if the minister in closing could give an indication of the timeline of that work. This certainly is progress because in 2013, as a member of the Economy Committee, um, I questioned uh, John Swinney um, on, on this, asking if there was any scope for Scottish Enterprise to tie the award of such funding, I was referring to regional support assistance, um, to criteria that state, for example, that the company must abide by taxation rules. And it is fair to say uh, that the response that I had was not as positive as the progress that we're seeing today. So I welcome this progress. The Scottish Government is using some of its powers to improve the livelihoods and working conditions of the workforce. This is exactly why we have a Scottish Parliament and I fully support the further devolution of powers over the regulation of employment. <coughs> But there does remain much to be done. Ensuring our next generation of workers are fully trained in the skills needed to work in a low carbon economy. Removing the barriers that too many women face when juggling career progression with bringing up children. It's still women who are the primary carers, as I've said before. And creating jobs that have real value and fulfil people's ambitions. And we still have to challenge the central assumption here 
when the government's motion, unamended, would conclude by backing economic growth, as, on, as though the only reason that we would strive for fair work is to make the country ever richer, or a few people in the country ever richer, and it's seen in purely financial terms. But this model is defunct and it's profoundly self-destructive. The pursuit of economic growth is hurtling us towards a climate and ecological breakdown. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report last year starkly laid out the consequences that this will have for people and planet unless we rapidly transition to a low carbon economy. A report from WWF involving 59 scientists from around the world found that we have wiped out 60% of the world's animal population since 1960. The natural environment is the basis of our economy and it's this life support system that we are destroying under cur our current economic model. And, and let me be clear, you know, there can't be fair work unless our economic model is fair to the planet. We will have hundreds of our young people outside this parliament uh, this Friday, you know, asking us to take action to address climate change. This is not an unconnected issue. All these issues are very much interconnected. So yes, Scotland can and must do everything it can to make work fairer for all. But a fair work nation means being fair to workers, to the environment that our livelihoods and very existence depends on, and to those future generations. It means restructuring our economy. And presiding officer, as far back in 2015, Greens commissioned the Jobs in Scotland's New Economy report, and it found that investing in the transferable skills of the offshore workers who are currently employed in oil and gas could create more than 200,000 jobs in the renewables industry by 2035, against the 156,000 that are currently provided by fossil fuel extraction. This is just one little example of the enormous rewards on offer to Scotland if we build a sustainable and inclusive economy where fair work is the norm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Rhoda Grant, close for Labour. Ms Grant, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Sadly, workers' hard-fought rights are being eroded. The gig economy, zero-hours contracts and the lack of collective bargaining have led to this, and young people and women bear the brunt. Careers that are gendered, that are predominantly female, suffer disproportionately. And Alison Johnston pointed out that we have the ninth highest gender pay gap in, in Scotland at 16.5%. During the debate, the nationalists have said they don't have the devolved power over employment law to do, do anything about this, and they don't have those powers. But instead of complaining about what they don't have, they should use the substantial powers that they do have to make a difference. John Mason questioned if you could use contracts and procurement to do this, and of course you can. Uh, as Neil Finlay and James Kelly pointed out, they voted down amendments to the procurement bill, not because it was illegal, but because they didn't want to do it. The Scottish Government and its agencies have enormous buying power, but they don't use this to push higher standards for all contracts. It's not enough to say that they'll extend fair work first to as many contractors as they can and possibly within six years time. They should do this now for all procurement and contracts. But they voted against this for the procurement bill and as pointed out by Richard Leonard, they're actively involving companies in their contracts that do not recognise trade unions. Further, has the Scottish Futures Trust and the Scottish Government signed up to unite the union's construction ch charter Fair work must be extended to government departments and agencies as well. Minister said they were starting to roll out fair work first with regional selective assistance. While any, more, um, while any move in the right direction is welcome, they will be signing contracts that will run for many years hence that will not have fair work principles at their core. James Kelly pointed out that since 2014, when the Scottish Government could have put a living wage into the procurement bill. There are 20,000 more people earning poverty wages. Annabel Ewing talked about the care sector. She talked about the heroes and heroines of that sector, and I absolutely agree with that. But on the 26th of February this year, the Fair Work Convention published its report, Fair Work in Scotland's Social Care Sector 2019. And the inquiry found, and I apologise for quoting at some length, that the social care sector is not consistently delivering fair work. The existing funding of the commissioning systems are making it difficult for some providers to offer fair work, 
and that so the social care workforce does not have the mechanism for workers to have an effective voice in influencing work and employment in the sector. In addition, given the predominance of women workers in the sector, the report also highlights that failure to address the issues such as a voice deficit and low pay will significantly contribute to women's poorer quality of work and Scotland's gender pay gap. The burden of variations in demand for social care is falling heavily on frontline staff who face zero hour contracts, sessional contracts, and working beyond contracted hours and working unpaid overtime to meet the needs of care service users. This is a sector that is almost entirely delivered by government contracts. It's an absolute disgrace. Bob Doris. Thank you, Member Given. Would the member appreciate that there's been success in relation to the social care sector? For example, a deal with the Scottish Government and local authorities means that the living wage is now paid to, to care staff in care homes across the country. And in Glasgow, for example, Cordy has been taken back in house by Glasgow City Council, which meant pay increases by female workers who were lower paid under Cordy until the SNP changed that way. Rhoda Grant. Any improvements in care staff working um, has to be welcomed, but some of those um, changes being made to care contracts are meaning that people are actually getting their hours cut. Um, they're not being paid yeah, for, for sleep-ins, for example. Um, so we need to look at the whole thing. We need to make sure that when people are working, they are being paid they are being paid a fair wage for that work and not having their overall pay cut just because they, they have sleep-ins as part of their, their, their working contract. We would pay a living wage of £10 an hour for all, while the SNP want a 5% reduction in poverty pay over the next three years. This is absolutely timid that only an additional 25,000 people will be paid a real living wage over the next three years, when 480,000 people are paid less than the real living wage in Scotland. It's an absolute drop in the ocean. Bill Bowman talked about unemployment and high rates of unemployment in Dundee and seemed to be saying that that was a reason not to pay a le real living wage. And that makes no sense to me at all because why should people on poverty pay pay for the misfortune of those that cannot find work. Surely we should be looking to the higher paid people to fill this gap rather than those already in low pay. And James Kelly made the point that the Scottish Government should have used fairer taxation rather than consigning 20,000 more people to poverty pay. Presiding officer, there's so much more we can do to create a fair work environment. The procurement powers that the Scottish Government and its agencies have are vast and the government must lead by example and also force up standards across all sectors of procurement and contracting. Neil Finlay said it's simply wrong that companies that operate a blacklist are receiving government contracts and I would have to declare an interest in that because my husband was blacked from the North Sea for demanding better health and safety protection. Rather than progress in six years time, we need fair work now for all workers today. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Colin Gordon Lindhurst, close to the Conservatives. Mr. Lindhurst, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I now close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, and I won't manage in doing so to name check all of those who spoke this afternoon and had something very worthwhile to say, because I think what we've seen from the debate is that uh, supporting people fairly in the workplace is something we all agree with and that it is not just something that's beneficial just for the employees but happier workers create more productive and better working environments and these in turn benefit employers and indeed the economy and society as a whole. We've heard today about some new and some updated commitments from this government including the refreshed Scottish business pledge with the living wage at its core but which aims to maintain a light touch approach. Bill Bowman, in his dulcet tones, talked about the example of Dundee, recently given recognition for its plans to become the first living wage city in the UK. That is, of course, an admirable goal, but one that needs to be developed across sectors to ensure that businesses buy into it while maintaining high standards and competitiveness. Other interesting initiatives in that plan include an online assistance tool to be developed for small and micro enterprises, 
These make up more than 99% of private sector businesses, the majority of which are unlikely to have large and complex human resource departments. Within a business support environment, which is already described as cluttered, it will be essential for this tool to be visible and accessible for the smallest of employers and their employees to benefit from. And perhaps the uh, minister can comment in closing on how such a tool will be rolled out within the wider business support system. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland as part of the United Kingdom is perfectly aligned to be able to benefit from the opportunities that exist in the modern technology driven era. And these rapid changes which are thrown up with their own challenges are what we must be prepared for. The Scottish Conservative Amendment today highlights the good work plan following the work of the Taylor Review on Modern Working Practices. Employees can now benefit from the rise in more flexible and varied ways of working, offering working patterns that allow families to mould working hours according to their own lives to suit them. But that, of course, should not mean that the protections that British people have relied upon through our strong track record of workers' rights should be eroded. And so we welcome today the extension of workers' rights that has been brought about by the Good Work Plan, which includes legislating to give all workers the right to request a more stable contract, thus making it easier for employees to access employment rights by extending the time required to break a period of continuous service and increasing as well the rights of agency workers. These are just some of the commitments that allow people to make the most of the opportunities afforded them by a modern economy. However, as we've heard today, there's much more that we can do and need to do if we want to bring everyone on this journey with us, including those currently without work. Uh, and again, Bill Bowman, in discussing the benefits of the living wage for Dundee, reminded us that the city has also the lowest employment rate in Scotland overall, so there's much to be done there. Michelle Ballantyne reminded us that only 55% of job seekers are accessing Fair Start Scotland, compared to 75% for the reserved UK programme. We also heard about the importance of the older workforce, whose experience and skills even in the technology-driven era, are immensely valuable. And indeed, I uh, met with apprentices last week, some of whom were telling me just that, that they valued very much the wisdom, the experience, and the assistance of older members of the workforce that they were involved in. Greater reskilling and lifelong learning opportunities for our older workforce, highlighted by Jamie Halcrow Johnson, would not only help those people find a place in the modern economy, but would allow businesses to access this wealth of knowledge and expertise that I've just spoken of. And we heard from Jeremy Balfour about the barriers that continue unfairly to stand in the way of those with a disability. He spoke about the need not only for greater support for disabled people looking for employment, but for employers to make the recruitment process more inclusive and fair with 24% of employers currently admitting that they would be less likely to employ someone with a disability. In concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, as has been evident today, both Scottish and UK governments are making commitments to our workforce that ensures they can thrive in the modern economy. It is essential that both work together in this endeavour. But as government realigns policy to fit with modern working practices, it must take everyone on that journey. As the Minister himself said in the forward to this action plan, fair work is an investment in everyone for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Jamie Hepburn to close the Government Minister till decision time, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking uh, the various members who have spoken in uh, to today's debate uh, to varying degrees. Uh, some have been more constructive than others from my own perspective but I do think the debate overall has been a worthwhile one. I do want to emphasise at the outset President I do believe that this is a collective endeavour. I think there has been much said across all parties to emphasise our support for fair work. So I do hope all parties will commit to supporting after we support the motion this evening 
to becoming involved in the round table that I have said I will uh, hold. I do not pretend that this action plan has all of the answers far from it. I do not uh, pretend for a moment that everything that is contained within this uh, action plan will uh, necessarily in of itself lead to us becoming a fair work nation. And on that basis, I do want to hear what others have uh, to say. Let me turn to uh, the uh, second uh, contribution to uh, the debate after my own of, of Mr. Halcrow uh, Johnson, which I actually did think was a, a very constructive contribution. So it is with some regret, I say at the outset, won't be supporting his uh, amendment uh, this evening. Uh, I uh, understand that he will want to be uh, uh, trumping, uh, trumpeting the, uh, the uh, good work uh, plan. But of course, we do have some reservations about its efficacy as a pro an approach. The Fair Work Convention has uh, expressed concern about the lack of consultation involvement in the Taylor Review and the good work uh, plan. And indeed, that uh, any measurement of quality of work would fall short of their expectations of what would be defined as fair work uh, expectations that this government uh, shares. But Mr Halcrow Johnson did talk about the other action plans that we uh, are taking forward, and I'm happy to provide a bit of an update in relation uh, to those. Uh, President, so Mr Halcrow Johnson spoke about, in the context of International Women's Day, uh, the gender uh, pay gap action plan, which I am uh, very uh, delighted to uh, announce as she's just arrived. The First Minister uh, launched on uh, Friday, uh, which I think was welcomed uh, by uh, a wide range of, of bodies. We've set a, a series of actions to try and uh, breach the, uh, the gender pay uh, gap that exists and persists in Scotland, uh, such as supporting 2,000 women to return to work after a career break uh, through our new Women Returners programme worth £5 million, uh, seeking to improve uh, work uh, place practices uh, for uh, victims of domestic abuse, supporting women through uh, the menopause, expanding the Workplace Equality Fund, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, of course showing uh, leadership as an employer undertaking uh, our own equal pay audit, as well as researching ways businesses can reduce uh, their gender uh, pay gap. Uh, in relation to the Future Skills Action Plan that uh, was mentioned, this is of the utmost importance. We know that our economy is changing. We know that our workforce needs to be adaptable, to be ready to respond to those uh, uh, circumstances and our Future Skills Action Plan will be published in due course. The disability employment uh, gap was mentioned by a, a number, uh, including Mr Halcrow Johnson. Of course, we uh, published our Disability Employment Action Plan on the 11th of December of last year. We have set an ambition to at least half the disability employment gap. The most optimistic uh, projections presiding officer at the current trajectory is that to achieve that would take some 200 years. We have set ourselves a target of achieving that within a tenth of that period of uh, time uh, and we lay out uh, the range of activity that we will try and take forward uh, to uh, that end. Uh, Jeremy Balfour uh, spoke of the need for government leadership. I absolutely uh, concur with that and one of the things of course we have committed to is uh, this spring publishing a recruitment and retention plan, setting a target for the employment of disabled people in our own uh, uh, workforce and we will encourage other public sector organisations to follow that uh, example. Uh, Willie Rennie, um, very briefly. Jeremy Balfour. I'm still grateful for the Minister uh, for that point. Would you agree that actually here at the Scottish Parliament we also need to do more to encourage people who have disabilities to come and work for us here? Minister. Uh, yes. I think that is a point well made and it's one I would endorse uh, entirely. Willie Rennie uh, asked some questions about the Fair Work at First uh, initiative that we've laid out. Uh, he, uh, I accused him of uh, misquoting me when I referred to it as a pilot. I have to apologise to him. I did look back. I did use uh, that term, but what I meant in that sense was not uh, a time-limited uh, sense of an initiative, but that we will lead the way by uh, rolling out our Fair Work First uh, agenda through a uh, Scottish Enterprise uh, Regional Selective Assistance uh, grants. That would be the first phase of our activity. Mr Rennie wondered if we'd be moving quickly enough. I can say that that activity will happen from next month. So I hope he would accept that that is moving uh, pretty swiftly, very briefly. Willie Rennie. For telling me that I'm right, which is always, always welcome. Um, can, can he tell me how many businesses does he think this will cover? How much money will be involved in this initial pilot? 
Minister. Well, I, I think I was almost saying I was wrong, and Mr. Rennie is correct, but we'll, uh, we'll, let, that, uh, we'll let that slide. It, I can't say because, of course, it's from April onwards, so it will apply to those that regional selective assistance is awarded to. So I can't say that at this stage. It would be disingenuous of me to suggest I could, but nonetheless, of course, we will begin uh, that uh, work. Alison Johnson looked for uh, the uh, timetable on uh, the wider work. That is, of course, the first element. We'll then engage with others about our wider uh, work. We will uh, then publish an implementation plan this summer and we will look to roll out the uh, entirety of... Just a uh, minute, Minister. There's too much chit-chat. You can talk to each other outside the chamber. I want to hear the Minister summing up, as do the members who took part in the debate. Minister, please. Thank you, uh, President Officer. They will then uh, look to roll out the rest of uh, Fair Work First Principles over uh, the uh, remainder of the parliamentary term. The, uh, Willie Rennie also spoke about the business pledge not having enough signatories. Bob Doris made that point. I agree with that. That's why we've refreshed the business pledge. That's why we want more people uh, to sign up to it. Uh, Bob Doris, in particular, talked about the need for small business to engage. I'm sorry, Minister. I think I'm speaking to myself. I said I want to hear the Minister, and I see people just ignoring me. Don't do it. Minister. Well, I greatly appreciate that, President Officer. Thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, I agree that we need to do more uh, to get uh, small business in particular to sign up to the uh, business pledge. That's why we've uh, tried to uh, reduce the complexity of sign up. That's why we're creating a business learning network and a leadership group to aim to increase the take up along with our new service for small and micro employers to adopt fair work uh, practices. I want to turn to Richard Leonard's uh, remarks. Um, he, uh, he, he really set out by introducing our fair work action plan as, as his uh, want. He did failed to uh, mention that the Poverty Alliance have welcomed uh, this plan. He failed to mention that the General Secretary of the STUC have welcomed uh, this action plan. Many others have uh, as well. But the, he also then uh, went on to talk about, uh, and so did James Kelly uh, uh, and Rhoda Grant, talk about our ambition to see 25,000 more workers paid at least the real living wage. That is, and has not been good enough, I agree that is not good enough. That is not our ambition. The point about the 25,000 extra people being paid at the real living wage is as a consequence of our funding through Poverty Alliance Activity. Of course I want to go further. And one of the things we could be doing today, if we had the power of employment law, is make it a statutory minimum wage, something we have set out we would do in our Fair Work Action Plan. I love the zeal of the convert. Of course, it was very welcome to see Mr Leonard set out that the Labour Party now believe and the devolution of employment law. I welcome that and I look forward to their working with us to ensure that the Scottish Parliament has responsibility for that in due course. Annabel Ewing spoke of the social care sector. I welcome the Fair Work Convention's inquiry report. We must do all we can. We are committed to funding payment of the real uh, living wage. We will do more. We will respond to that uh, report in due course. John Mason mentioned the flexible work agenda. That is very important. That's why we've committed £150,000 to family-friendly working Scotland this coming year. Uh, Stuart McMillan mentioned the, the Carers Act, and had I seen the news this morning, I was aware of it. Uh, I think it's an excellent piece of legislation. I know that because I took it through Parliament, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, but of course, it is the Minister for Public Health and Sport who will respond. But yes, I do agree it must be implemented. One of the things I can say through the Fair Work Action Plan is we will better promote the Carers Positive a scheme that Dick Lyle uh, mentioned. Bill Kidd talked about support for refugees to get into employment. The Scottish Government funds and supports the recognition of prior qualification scheme that Glasgow Caledon University and the Bridges programme uh, takes forward. But we will, of course, be uh, willing to consider what more we can uh, do. Let me close, uh, Presiding Officer. Alison Johnson, uh, in welcoming the action plan, uh, said that there's still much more to be done. I agree with those sentiments entirely. There is, there has been much achieved, but there is still much to be done. And I said that at the outset. That's why we have this Fair Work Action Plan. That's why we're having this debate. That's why I want to bring people together to discuss how we can do this collectively. We should back this motion before us and we should commit to working together to that end. Thank you very much. Uh, and that concludes this afternoon's debate. And we're going to move straight to decision time uh, to vote on the motion. So the first question is that Amendment 16257.3 in the name of Jamie Halcrow Johnson, which seeks to amend Motion 16257 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on working to make Scotland a fair work nation by 2025, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. 
were not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16257.3 in the name of Jamie Halker Johnson is yes 31, no 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 16257.1 in the name of Richard Leonard, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jamie Hepburn, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16257.1 in the name of Richard Leonard is yes, 24, no, 90. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 16257.2 in the name of Alison Johnson, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jamie, Jamie Hepburn, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16257.2 in the name of Alison Johnson is yes, 94, no, 20. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 16257 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended on working to make Scotland a fair work nation by 2025 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16257 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended is yes, 93, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move now to members' business in the name of Andy Whiteman on who owns Scotland. But we'll just take a few moments uh, for members and the minister to change seats. A few moments before we begin. 